Welcome to the 15th meeting in 2023 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I would like to remind everyone present to switch their mobile phones to silent, and we have received apologies from Oliver Mundell. The next item of business is to decide whether to take item 6 in private. Is the committee content to take this item in private? Yes. Moving to agenda item number 2, uh, we are taking evidence on the Trusts and Succession Scotland Bill. Can I welcome Yvonne Evans, the Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of Dundee, Professor George Gretton, Emeritus Lord President, Reid uh, Professor of Law at the University of Edinburgh, and Professor Roderick Paisley, the Chair of Scots Law at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, welcome to you. I'd also like to note that the Mercedes Vialba is joining us online today. Can I can remind all attendees uh, to not worry about turning on the, your microphone during the session, as these are controlled by broadcasting. And if you would like to come in on any questions, please just raise your hand or, or, or just kind of catch my eye or indicate to the clerks. Uh, and if you cannot answer the question, please feel free to follow up in writing or simply indicate that this is not for you to respond to. So we'll now move to questions from the committee. So first of all, I'll, I'll open for the committee. Uh, can you confirm for the benefit of the committee whether you support the general principles of the bill? And if so, what do you see as the, the bill's key strengths? And we will certainly get into some specific areas of the bill uh, as we progress through the session. Yes, I uh, very much welcome the bill. Uh, I support its general principles. Um, this is a much needed measure, uh, as I'm sure you, you, you're very aware. Uh, our trust law has not had a proper overhaul since 1921. There have been bits and pieces, um, but it's now uh, pretty badly out of date. Um, uh, comparative jurisdictions have done a lot of reform in recent years. Uh, in England, there is a, a project just started for a complete overhaul of their trust law, but even then, they have done more in recent years to, to update their law than, than we have. So uh, we're falling behind, and if nothing's done in, in the next few years, it's going to look even worse. Um, what the bill does, it, it, it restates a lot of the existing principles uh, that were, it were in the legislation, but does so in updated uh, terms. It, it also introduces certain new provisions, which are, are very welcome. So uh, I would strongly support it. Trusts are an important part of the law. Uh, strongly support it. There, there, are, I, I, uh, there are some bits and pieces which I think do need revisiting, but then that's uh, inevitable, of course. I think that's probably... A, I could go on for hours, but I think that's probably enough. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I fully support this bill in its principles and outline. It, it so much so that I would imagine quite a lot of what I'm about to say and George and Yvonne will say today appears like nitpicking to improve detail, but it's a really necessary bill. If, if there were one thing I would say, however, I'd like to say a little bit more on succession in this bill, and that's an area of the law that is needing revisiting, but it's a very, very welcome bill, and it's particularly well thought out in many respects. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Delighted to finally see this um, coming to fruition, um, hopefully in the near future. Um, and as um, has been said, just minor tweaks, minor hopefully improvements that we can perhaps suggest to you. Okay, no, thank you. Um, can I just go into just uh, kind of one aspect? Uh, one thing that's come up thus far in the bill is the issue regarding the Section 104 order. Um, and um, do, do the panellists believe that um, uh, that both Scottish and UK governments uh, should potentially design some type of protocol uh, so that uh, when, when a bill comes forward and if there is a Section 104 issue, that uh, it can automatically be, uh, be dealt with? Uh, you, you mean in, in general, not just for this bill, as a, as a general? No, just in general, because I mean, obviously, we, last week the Parliament passed the movable transactions, and the Section 104 order was uh, was one of the kind of the, the outstanding uh, issues in the bill. And, all, and certainly at the very beginning of this uh, bill, uh, the Section 104 order has has arisen again. Uh, so I suspect that uh, as uh, more SLC bills come forward, uh, and potentially other uh, legislation. The Section 104 order might be might become more of an issue. So, it's, um, do you think if if, a, if some type of protocol was was put together, um, would that actually help in terms of the, the advancement of 
be any legislation. Um, that's more of a question that we're moving more towards, uh, well, it's not exactly constitutional law, but it's getting near there. Um, and I don't have a strong view about that. It is an issue, of course. Um, I was there last week when the stage three debate, and I was uh, cheering up in the gallery and being shushed by, by, the, by the staff there. Um, uh, and I understand why the Scottish Government is a little bit cautious on, on these uh, ledge comp issues, because if it's, if it's put in and then there's a problem, it, 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 it's, it's safer to do it this way, to leave out the provision uh, in the case of uh, movable transactions, provisions about um, uh, the financial instruments or whatever the terminology is, and then wait for a 104 order. So I think that is the right way to go. Whether a, a protocol it, it, it would be possible, you'd need to ask people like Chris Hemsworth, Christine O'Neill, and experts on, on in that area rather than myself. I don't think I can offer a a useful view, but it can be a bit of a, a technical problem. For instance, here, if uh, just if, uh, if if pension schemes are left out from the bill as they are, uh, if this went through and there was, for some reason there was no Section 104 order or no timeless Section 104 order, I suppose it took a couple of years, you'd then be in a little bit of a black hole for pension schemes governed by Scots law because the 1921 Act is repealed in toto. And so you'd have the position that, that Scottish regulated pension trusts would be in a black hole. So if this goes through, I think it would be very important to secure that the 104 order will, will be forthcoming timelessly. Uh, that's not very helpful, but that, that's all I can say. I don't know if... No. Uh, I, mean, I, think the, um, I think certainly the committee uh, generally appreciate the... Uh, the work of both uh, Scottish and UK governments uh, with regards to the Movable Transactions Bill, uh, with regards to the Section 104 order, because uh, there, there has been uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work uh, taking place there. Uh, so uh, the question wasn't posed as a trick question or, or uh, any type of constitutional uh, question. It was just to, to try to see if there was any uh, potentially a, maybe a smoother way uh, to. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't offer you anything on that particular point. No bother. That's good. No, thank you. Uh, Jeremy, what do you want? Thank you, Commissioner, and good morning to the panel. If I can come back to the specific bill, um, it looks like it takes about a year to do a Section 104 if everyone's moving smoothly. Do you think there's any way that we could amend this bill to avoid a Section 104, um, which would then mean it would all come into force at the same time? Or, in your views, is a Section 104, because of the um, pension scheme, inevitably going to have to happen? Pensions should be covered in this. Um, pensions are obviously a huge value. Um, we have a big industry of pensions in Scotland, and it's a hugely important part of trust law. So I would say, even if there was a delay, it's probably important to include pensions. There's one tiny point on pension schemes that I want to bring to your attention. It's, it's a, I noticed the, there's no definition of pension schemes in this trust and section bill, although there was a definition for a particular statutory provision, a particular section in the bill as produced by the Scottish Law Commission. And I don't know whether that's deliberate or whether it's an oversight, but pension schemes are not defined at all, as far as I read it. Yeah, I would agree that just that's a point that needs just double-checked. Um, yes, timing is going to be important. Um, and I suppose the answer is this this gets passed and, uh, uh, and then commencement delayed to the 104 order is, is ready. I suppose that's the way you do it. But I've got no personal experience with 104 orders. I've done many things in my life. Fought as a mercenary in the Horn of Africa, but I've never actually been involved. I was just making that up. Uh, but I've, I've never actually been involved in a Section 104 order. I don't have the hands-on experience there. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, on the, the 2nd of May, the Scottish Law Commission said to the committee that it's important that, uh, that the trust law reforms ultimately apply to the pension trusts as well. And uh, you just touched upon the, the issue there regarding the definition. Uh, and so just on this, um, do you think that the, um, if the pension trusts aren't included, um, uh, uh, will that have a detrimental effect in terms of the implementation of the law? If they're not included in the bill, which is currently they're not indeed, and if there's no Section 104 order, that's, that is going to be a problem. I mean, then in that case, for example, the 1921 Act is going to have to be kept in force just for pensions, and that would be 
off your mercy. I absolutely agree. And, you know, um, trust lawyers who advise on trusts are advising on pension trusts, and you don't want to have two separate bits of law to have to know. And have, you know, we don't really want the 1921 Act to have to carry on um, once we've got the new Act. So, uh, would it be common to actually operate using two separate bits of legislation? Oh, we, we operate using many, many bits of legislation, but um, this is a chance to tidy that up and make it much more simple to look at where the law is. Yes. Right. But, even, but even if it were to, uh, for talking's sake, that the 1921 legislation were to be uh, still in use purely for this aspect, for, for talking's sake, whether it's six months or whether it's a, a year, as uh, Jeremy touched upon, um, although it's, it would be complicated, uh, well, well, messy and untidy, um, would it be impossible to do? Not impossible, no. no. Okay. Not impossible, though. Oh, uh, as it, the bill stands, the 1921 Act is repealed. So yeah. if there's a possibility of this uh, bill being passed and coming into force before a 104 order is uh, available, then uh, the bill would have to keep the 21 Act alive for pension funds. Yeah. Uh, as Yvonne says, possible, but awfully messy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Mercedes. Thanks, convener. Uh, just checking that everyone in the room can hear me. Yes. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. Um, so we, we know that there um, may be forthcoming reforms to capacity law due to the report of the Scottish Mental Health Review. Um, so can I ask uh, the panel, with regards to future proofing the trust bill, um, can that be achieved simply by ensuring that there's a route to easily amend the definition of incapable in the bill, or would more significant structural tra changes um, to, to the trust legislation be required? Um, well, my first point, is, I'd say, is that um, a, a, Setting aside for a moment the, the new bill on, on charities, which is in, in the pipeline, uh, the current definition of incapable in, in this bill is, of course, essentially the same as the definition of incapable in the Adults with Incapacity Act. Um, uh, but it might have been neater to do what is often done in legislation. Instead of copying out the definition from another act, but simply to say, has the same meaning as. Uh, and that can be, although it, in a way it's a little bit of a fiddle-faddle for users because then they've got to look at the other act, overall it is more convenient for users because they can then see what the, the uh, interpretation is of that uh, definition in the other act by case law or by commentators. Um, so instead of a, a user of this bill, if it's enacted, might look at that definition and think, what does this mean? Uh, and they wouldn't start off with any find any, any interpretation of it. But if it's it referenced, it has the same meaning as in adults with that incapacity, they can immediately turn to the textbooks on, on uh, uh, that area of law. And, 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 and that, that approach is often used in legislation. You often see this term has, you know, the word company in this act has the same meaning as the word company as defined in the Companies Act 2006, for example. Uh, so that's the first general comment. So that, that might have been preferable drafting technique, but um, that's for the drafters to decide. Uh, but I agree with you that future-proofing is desirable, that, that the, the term incapable as used in, in the trust legislation should track what's in the, the adults within capacity legislation. Um, uh, and it's a drafting question of the best way to do it, but I agree with you that would be the, it would be unfortunate, I think, if the meanings were to drift apart. I would agree with that. Absolutely, and I think it would help the interpretation of this section if, it, if there was, as um, George has said, a body of case law to look at. I think there are potential problems with interpretation of what we have here um, about incapacity, and I think there is a problem about judging capacity, especially if we might be talking here about trustees trying to judge capacity as well. Okay. The two are identical because so many trusts are set up for individuals who lack capacity or have a risk of capacity, and a decision in one area, really, it really would be useful if it were useful and applicable across the board. Okay, thank you. Mercedes? Thank you very much. Well, 
I was just going to ask a follow up in terms of um, seeking to amend the bill um, in line with that approach. Um, would that then mean that um, the definition would automatically be updated when it was updated in in the Adults with Incapacity Act? So, is is it then a sort of more streamlined option um, to future proofing this bill? If instead of having a set definition, it, it refers to the definition and interpretation in another act? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, uh, it is a drafting question how to do that, but the answer is yes. The general, the general answer to that question is yes. And, and uh, as I say, I think it would be desirable. Uh, and it's a good point. Thank you very much. Okay. okay thank you. Um, General Balfour. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> if I can move on to the bill's interaction. Uh, with charity law. Um, you'll be aware there's a charity law bill going through the Parliament at the same time. And under Section 8 of the Charities Bill, currently before Parliament, Oscar would have an administrative power to appoint interim trustees to charitable trusts on its own initiative. I'm just wondering how do you think this would work with the current court's power to appoint trustees under Chapter 1 of the Trust Bill? Is there an interaction there? This is an interesting one. Interim trustees are a kind of new novel idea. Um, I think they have uh, good uses, perhaps in, in charities, if you want to kind of continue with a charity that otherwise would um, struggle to carry on without um, appointing interim trustees. Um, there is a sort of uneasy interaction, I think, between the, these two bills, perhaps. Um, I mean, one thing I think is missing from the section of this bill is um, the option to add trustees um, for the, the current trustees. So it's about um, removal of trustees by co-trustees, but you haven't got the option to add trustees, for example. So that could cover the sort of interim trustee situation if that was added into this bill, and then it would make that less necessary in the other bill. Um. I haven't studied the, the new Charities Bill in detail, but uh, so this is a bit provisional, but I think that they can run in tandem, these provisions, uh, so that in addition to these general provisions in this bill, you'd have the special provisions in the Charities Bill about interim trustees and OSCA. And I, 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 when I had a quick look at this, I, I didn't see any reason why they shouldn't run in, in tandem. But as I said, it was just a quick look. I haven't investigated this in detail. I think the two can run in tandem. I would just like to be sure that the provisions uh, enabling the conveyance of property to trustees and interim trustees would be sufficiently well defined to operate in both cases. And then just follow my up, then, do you think there should be some kind of explanation on the face of this bill referring to the Charities Bill so that interaction is understood going forward or with simply an explanation note? Suffice. I think you could say that you know when you're referring to trustees here that you would also include um, interim trustees appointed under um, the charities bill. That would be fine, and then I think that would merge the two the two things. Although, as I say, I think an expansion of this um, bill slightly could also help. Thank you, Kit. Thank you, Kit. Okay. And Bill Kit. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, panel. Um, now. In the responses to the committee's call for views, Gillespie McAndrew and the Law Society thought the circumstances covered by the grounds, especially the ground unfit to carry out the duties of a trustee, um, maybe should be clarified. And I know that Yvonne Evans had made some comments on this. Um, so Section 6 of the Bill sets out various grounds under which the courts can remove a trustee uh, do you think the circumstances necessary to establish these grounds are clear enough as yet, or is further statutory guidance necessary? And if you'd like to add more detail, what would you like to see added, please? I think this, as I said, this is important because it um, could be other trustees, lay trustees, who are making this decision. And what do they understand about what unfit means? Um, I think uh, some respondents have uh, raised a concern that this could be used vexatiously as well. Um, so I think it is quite important that we do have a sort of common-ish understanding of, of what is unfit. Um, what's the meaning of that? What's the definition? And um, in terms of, I mean, challenging, um, you know, if someone might actually present in a vexatious manner, I mean, how would, how would that be taken up? 
trustee was being pushed out um, oh. because the other trustees were saying they were unfit, they could um, go to court to resist um, being pushed out. Um, whether in practical reality they'd want to stay on as a trustee in that circumstance is probably another matter, um, but they could resist in the court. Yeah. Okay, and Professor Paisley? I'd like to just make a comment to link this to the topic of the executor who has murdered the deceased. This, I understand, is a provision that some might think would deal with that particular issue of an executor who has murdered the deceased. It actually doesn't, where a trustee, it said here, is unfit to carry out the duties of a trustee. This is the power of removal, but the rule at Scots Law, in the case law, is that someone who murders the a testator isn't a trustee and is never a trustee. So you can't remove someone who isn't a trustee and is never a trustee. And later on, you might want to look at that. But I think that's a provision that really should be added to this bill to clarify what is already the law, because the consultation carried out by the Scottish a parliament before now actually has confused the area very considerably. A, it missed the case law. It didn't identify the principle that was relevant. And it simply said the law in this area is a mess and has referred to one book. The snag about having gone out to consultation with the Scottish Parliament is this is now being quoted as if it is case law, as if it is a decision. And actually going out to consultation on that point and coming to no decision has actually greatly influenced the advice given by solicitors who themselves don't research the law. But these cases do exist and it would be a quick win for the Scottish Parliament and a sensible provision. It's utterly repugnant to all uh, views of decency that someone who murders a testator should become their executor. But this provision does not in any respect deal with that. I think that's, um, that's very important, actually, and, um, and uh, a good pointer for, um, for uh, the primary committee to, to look into that, I think, actually. So, um, but thank you very much for that. That's agree that uh, it, this bill should have something on the homicidal executor. Um, it would be easy to do. It wouldn't have lots of consequentials. It wouldn't be controversial. Uh, just do it. Uh, on section six, removal of trustee by a court, I, uh, I'm actually more relaxed about this than perhaps Yvonne is. Uh, I, I, think, um, uh, I, I think this is workable and uh, I don't think it's going to cause problems. It's, of course, it's a matter of judgment. Can I just note that they, uh, where a trustee is unfit to carry out the duties of a trustee, in my experience, the, the biggest fights come in trusts, in what might be called constitutional trusts for churches. Someone will say, you're not fit to carry out the duties of a trustee because you don't adhere to this particular doctrine or whatever spin it is on the particular doctrine. I think you're just going to have to trust the courts to get this right. You, you won't be able to legislate in detail for absolutely everything that, that comes about. So I, I am slightly more relaxed than Yvonne in this and would uh, assent to what George has said. It's always nice to have some minor disagreement between the panellists anyway. <laughs> so I think so. Thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. So just before we do move on, just for a point of clarification regarding the, the consultation, uh, it was the Scottish Government consultation and not the Scottish Parliament consultation. No, yep. no problem. No problem. Yep. Um, so, just uh, uh, also, we're just speaking about section six there, but on section seven, so that if a trustee uh, doesn't get to participate in trust decisions under section 12 when they are incapable, so trustees can also remove a fellow trustee from the role under section seven on the basis that the trustee is incapable. Now, the risk of abuse of these provisions has been highlighted to the committee. Uh, do you see merit in those concerns, and if so, how can we safeguard against those risks? Professor Green. Yes, I, I saw the, those comments. Again, I'm, uh, I'm actually fairly relaxed about it. It's, it's maybe the drugs I'm taking, but uh, I'm fairly relaxed about this. Uh, th this is only going to happen when there's a majority against this, this person anyway. So uh, if the, 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 the trustee who, who is... Uh, uh, unsatisfactory, regard as unsatisfactory, uh, they, go, they can't uh, control the trust decisions anyway because the majority can make the decision. So they're, they're in a sense out of it anyway. Uh, uh, so booting them off the, the, the board is, is in a way not a huge further step. 
Sorry, that's not very coherently expressed, but um, maybe I should try it again. But uh, if they're, they're going to be a minority anyway, because otherwise you wouldn't get the majority to get rid of them. So if they're a minority already, they're, um, uh, they may be causing a bit of trouble, they may be a bit of a nuisance, but uh, this is not ultimately going to make any difference in principle to what the trust actually does and decides. Um, and again, I, I, I don't think we're likely to see a lot of abuse or a lot of litigation arising out of this. But um, maybe I'm being too optimistic. Professor mm. Paisley? I would agree with that. Uh, again, there, there, there are going to be individual cases where most of the problems in trusts and getting rid of trustees are not problems of law. They're not problems of property law either. Uh, they're problems of personalities. and. Generally, in my experience, a, it's someone on, amongst the trustees acts in a strange way and the others decide they just have to get rid of this individual because they can't work with them. These do work their way out through their courts very occasionally, but I don't see any enormous mischief with the wording that I see in front of me. I think this is quite good. Yeah. Move on. I tend to agree that it's, it's good to have a mechanism that doesn't involve the courts. So. Okay, so, so just with that then, I mean, can, well, could an aggrieved trustee raise uh, the court action in these circumstances? And, and if so, what do you think the legal basis is uh, for that actual court action? Well, it's going to be a denial of one of these grounds. It's going to be a factual thing. And if that did happen, it could turn nasty and there could be nasty litigation. Um, but that can happen... Um, I'm trying to pursue my thoughts here. Um, yeah, you yeah, go ahead. I, I, sure. I've seen one or two of these in practice, and the there is a statute. George will remember the name of it better than me. Where that if someone re re repeatedly raises litigation, they can be excluded from a vexatious litigant act. It's the, being consolidated, <laughs> really. Yeah, that's it. That, that's the trust law is the only circumstance where I have seen that litigation goes on and on and on because an individual has been removed as a trustee and has decided they didn't agree that the grounds had been established. And these individuals then get the taste for legislation and just continue for years. I, I discovered an individual in Kilmarnock Sheriff Court who did this, and it went on for about 20 years until he basically was uh, disqualified under the legislation and then can only bring court action, provided he gets the consent of a, you know, the, the relevant official. But by and large, I think that's right at the edge. It doesn't happen very frequently. When you see it, your eyes light up as an academic because it's something really unusual. And th th this, I think, is reasonably good. To, to avoid being dismissed as a trustee, it would have to be a complete denial that these circumstances exist. And I think that could be done by a declarator or something like that. OK, well, thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, just pursuing further on Section 7, and I know there's been a bit of differential between the three of you in regards to your submission, so please feel free to critique each other. Um, but on this, Section 7 of the Bill sets out various grounds under which the majority of trustees can remove fellow trustees, as we discussed. Um, I just wonder, should these grounds need to be expanded or altered? So we've got, in regard to incapable trustees, but should there be other grounds that we should put into the Bill? this with sort of disqualification for company directors and uh, sort of Oscar sanctioned uh, trustees and so on as well uh, and perhaps also including people who've been uh, uh, the equivalent English equivalent of uh, Oscar charity commission who've been kind of um, warned off being trustees there as well yeah I'm inclined I, I, I haven't got a concluded view on this but I'm inclined to think that what Yvonne says is right and maybe this should apply to both section 6 and section 7 um, uh, th these things should be mentioned I, I would agree with all of that uh, I, I would just add one a qualification to that is that when you do bring in a, a possibility of removal of a trustee by co-trustees on the basis that they've been convicted of an offence involving dishonesty a, it might be difficult as a matter of fact to get evidence of foreign convictions to the satisfaction of a, a Scottish court. So how would you deal with that then? Well, by and large, you just have to ignore it, is the honest truth. Uh, you, you can't get 
the reliable evidence aid, you possibly would deal with it by another ground altogether. You, you would water this down and not require a conviction. You would require something else, but I don't like that. I, I like some certification of dishonest behaviour. I don't think an allegation or an assertion of dishonesty is good enough. So if I could just push, pursue that slightly further, if I'm convicted in a foreign jurisdiction, yep. is your concern that that jurisdiction isn't completing trials properly? I mean, I'm, I'm just a wee bit confused. I mean, presumably if I'm convicted in X country, yep. that would be a, 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 on public record within that country. You don't think that's enough? I, I have no problem with establishing convictions for people who are in the United States of America or the Irish Republic or France or something like that. But if someone's coming out of a Iraq or something like that where the records are, are gone, I'm deeply uneasy about that. I've come across a few situations with Pakistan and it's just impossible to get these records uh, to the satisfaction of any anyone. Now, this is a civil matter. A, essentially trusts are civil matters, so I think you could possibly prove that someone had been convicted a, a, on the civil standard in Scotland a, and have a disqualification apply without having to produce a certificate of a conviction abroad. But it's pretty messy. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Bill Kidd. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just uh, looking at section 10 uh, and because a lot of these obviously have crossovers here, actually, but section 10 on discharge of trustees um, and discharge being separate from the resignation or removal of a trustee. Um, now, at paragraphs 93 and 94 of the policy memorandum, the Scottish Government highlighted a potential policy issue in relation to section 10 of the bill and a guardian consenting to a discharge of a trustee on behalf of an under 16 year old in a small family trust circumstance. Um, do you have any concerns about potential conflict of interest that uh, might be involved here? And uh, is it a valid policy concern? And do you have any insights as to how these could be resolved? It's a fairly common occurrence ah, okay. um, in a small family trust to have the trustees being members of the family. So, you know. But whether it's a, it's a real important concern, I'm not very convinced. Um, people, when, when they're acting on behalf of their under 16, they should be acting in their best interest. So you know, they kind of have trustee duties over them at that okay. point. Okay. I, I just, just um, obviously, as you say, it's, it's not something that's unknown because it's reasonably common. It's just that because it is so common, the potential for an occasional breach of... Um, of trust, uh, if I could put it that way, might actually take place. Um, you know, it's just some concern over that, basically, and how the under 16 year old or who might represent them then, or whatever. Well, I think the alternative would be probably expensive. You know, you'd either have to appoint someone separate to consider that person a curator of some sort or um, give jurisdiction to the accountant of court or something like that. So you could build in extra protection, but it would come at a cost. Right. Okay. And yeah, I would agree with what Yvonne has just said. Aye. And Professor Paisley? There are one or two a court decisions on trusts looking at the issue of conflict of interest where there are trusts that have been set up a, in family situations and the court tends to the view that the conflict of interest rules a, let's just say are applied slightly less strictly or at least are known in advance because the person who set up the trust would have recognised that these conflicts would have arisen and it's just about impossible in many situations for the trustee to avoid the conflict of interest. If there's anything egregious, I'm absolutely content that the courts have sufficient powers under this bill to intervene and deal with it. Okay, well that's, that's excellent. Thank you very much for, uh, to all of you for that. Thank you. Mr. May just kind of on uh, that particular uh, point, uh, I mean, I know that the Scottish government were they, they certainly were keen to explore um, to the kind of extent as to whether uh, this problem might arise in practice. Uh, I mean, that was touched upon in the in the policy memorandum. Um, so, do you, do you believe that there are sufficient safeguards, legal safeguards, uh, already in place to protect the beneficiaries under the age of sixteen? Yeah, simply yes, 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 as we just said. Okay. Right, thank you. 
Mercedes. Thank you, Karina. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to um, move us on to talking about um, trustees' powers of investment. Um, so I know that uh, Ms. Evans, along with the Law Society, has uh, suggested that um, in view of um, Scotland's increasing emphasis on um, net zero, um, that section 16 and 17 could be amended to allow trusts to adopt um, environmentally friendly investment policies, particularly um, when those kind of um, investments might underperform compared to other investments. Um, so we're keen to hear from, from the other panel members um, their views about this policy idea. And then in terms of um, drafting, um, the Scottish Law Commission seemed to think that the bill would actually permit trustees to focus on environmentally friendly investments already. Um, so I suppose a question for everyone is whether you agree or if you think the bill would need to be altered to achieve that policy outcome, either partially or fully. Perhaps we could start with Professor Grattan. Yes. I'm very aware of these issues. I haven't researched the point. Um, one preliminary point to make, of course, is that if the trust deed says that investment in, in green investments is, is permitted or, or even required, then, then that is fine. But the, the issue is, what if the trust deed is silent? Uh, as I say, I haven't researched the point, and I'm, I'm a bit... I don't see my way clearly. I think I would probably just shut up there because I don't think I've got anything to add uh, without further research. Okay, thank you. It, if you have a look at the, the existing law of trusts, there was a difficulty with Edinburgh City Council, I think it was called, Edinburgh City Council that decided to disinvest from South Africa when it disliked the disgusting apart apartheid regime in South Africa. And there's always a price to be paid for being principled. And uh, it's generally the case, I would accept, that uh, those people who cut corners on morals and decency will make money. And if the opportunity is there, coupled with an obligation that you must maximise returns, you do put trusts in a bit of a bind that a uh, they will have to do things that would be disconformed to their conscience. But George's point comes in full square here. Many trusts are set up originally with the opportunity and also the obligation on trustees to, tr to pick, a, to pick a, those investments that are a, compatible with the environment and compatible with a, principles and, and morals as they change. I think this issue could be addressed by looking at the possibility of changing trust purposes for those trusts that are already set up. And when trusts are new, trust deeds now offered by solicitors in Scotland will offer those people who want to set up trust, do you want a, the ability to invest only in ethical investments? And I, I think that will work its way through fairly quickly. And I'd, I'd, I'm reasonably sanguine that this will work out in the law of trusts. So you don't see a, a need to amend the bill um, further to to account for that? You think it can be done in other ways? Yes, I think it can be done in other ways. Thank you. Okay, Yvonne? I feel a bit more strongly um, in support of, uh, of this and I'm actually on the Law Society um, Trust and Succession Committee so it's me that's fed this point into them I think as well. Um, I think it's um, quite important. I do agree, I saw Lord Drummond Young's evidence um, last week. Um, I agree with him that you can um, imply um, this from uh, Section 17, this power, um, but I do think that the legislation should expressly state um, that it can be a consideration for the trustees when they're making investment decisions. Um, I think this is important for our future proofing of uh, the trust legislation. Um, there's also been a case in England, um, Butler Sloss against the Charity Commission, that's really just clarified that um, their equivalent um, part of their trust law um, can be read as giving trustees power to um, enact ESG goals as part of their consideration um, of what to invest in. Um, and particularly, um, as I've said in my written evidence, um, if that investment might 
uh, not be as profitable as other investments or indeed might make a loss. Um, I just think fundamentally it would empower trustees, um, remind them, if anything. It, you could say this is just messaging, um, but I think it's actually quite an important to have this as a clear, defined starting point. So you're not leaving it to trustees to think, oh, this can be implied. This is interpret. We can interpret the law as including this. Um, I think a statement that puts that beyond doubt, um, because obviously in England they had the, hi the High Court case uh, to clarify that. We don't. If we wrote it in, we wouldn't ha then need to have a case to clarify that if someone um, objected. Um, I think also trustees, um, and I would agree with Lord. Drummond Young, when he said, obviously, trustees, you don't want um, them being cavalier um, in their investment choices. So it needs to be part of the full consideration of all the options. But equally, um, I don't want trustees to be too cautious um, by not wanting to consider um, what else they could do um, ethically, particularly in public trusts um, and charitable trusts, but also perhaps in private purpose trusts um, for some um, issues as well. Um, so I think this could embolden and empower trustees to use um, the law in this way um, and prevent them from being quite so cautious and concerned about someone questioning their decisions on investment. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And could I, if the convener will allow, could I ask a follow-up? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, to, uh, Ms Evans, in terms of the, the, the practical um, way we could we could change this bill, we could amend this bill. Um, you mentioned a, a statement. So would that be a sort of for avoidance of doubt clause, or how do you see it working practically? I think, I think you could um, you could add in in section seventeen. You know, um, to have regard to the suitability of um, to the trust of the, the proposed in investment, um, and then you could say you know specifically including. Um, environmental, social and governance goals. Just a reminder that we're not simply talking here about financial goals. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And then Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if I could just follow up slightly. Um, I mean, I, in a previous life, I was working with a trust who were trying to buy property off another trust. And their view was they always had to get best values or highest price because they, would, they were scared. Would this help that situation? as well as not only investments but actually selling off eligible property you don't have to get the best price if you're part of the money onto another charity or is there a way around that because there are quite a number of trusts who almost use that as an excuse not to sell to another trust because they keep saying they've got to get best value yeah, absolutely. As I say, I think that there needs to be a balance when trustees are considering what they're going to do and why. And it shouldn't always be about getting the best price. They need to look at the trust purposes and how best can they serve um, the purposes of that trust in their decisions. So, yes, I think it would help those sorts of situations. Thank you. OK, thank you. And Bill Kidd. Yes, thank you very much. Um, part one um, of the bill, Chapter 5, um, is relation to duration of a trust. Um, and Law Society, Yvonne Evans and Turk and Connell have all made comment uh, in terms of this. Um, but it's um, Professor Paisley, I believe, uh, your joint response with Professor McPherson to the committee's consultation. You commented on Chapter 5 uh, of the bill um, on this duration, which said that... Um, someone should be able to create a trust of any duration they like. And you said, we wonder whether sufficient consideration has been given to the consequences. Uh, this change could have significant economic impact as certain trusts accumulate assets over a sustained period of time and accordingly gain sizable economic power. Uh, can you explain a wee bit more about your policy concerns here, please? Yes, certainly. Now, I would have to say in advance, I'm not an economist. I, I, I'm a lawyer, so I, it, it may appear in the eyes of economists that what I'm about to say is quite simplistic. But it, it's broadly speaking this. I, once a trust is established and does a gain assets, it obtains a certain amount of economic power. And it, a trust in itself can become an entity that just, if it's, if it's perpetual it can grow to a very considerable size and have a very considerable amount of influence. 
and it's the lack of investigative powers to work out what's going on inside the trust uh, from the point of view of the state that worries me. It, I, I could tie this in with another part of this bill whereby some of the trusts, particularly the beneficiary lacking trust without beneficiaries, are able to change their domicile. It, that really worries me very considerably because if a trust that can last forever can be set up in Scotland uh, and changes its domicile, whether it be to England, that's another jurisdiction, or Northern Ireland, or even anywhere else, it then becomes absolutely impossible for the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, to find out who controls that trust through the Register of Controlled Interests. It's the easiest thing in the world to set this up, and then it just escapes the jurisdiction almost immediately. You won't be able to work out who owns land, you won't be able to work out a, who really has the benefit from assets. I, I regard this as a real difficulty when coupled with this change of domicile point. I don't think you'll be able to work out whether Russians own parts of Scotland uh, or anything else about it. Now, the economic point of a, a great accumulation of wealth is really the type of thing you'll come across in antitrust legislation in America, where you have... A assets owned by individuals that's disguised by a trust that goes on for a long, long time, and you have gen transmission of intergenerational wealth that simply grows and grows. And I do not think that unless there is some counterbalance in some form uh, to find out what's going on, that this is really good for the state. Um, are you suggesting that it's, um, it's a a charitable trust, for instance, could be hijacked into being a private business, and but still using the the frontage of a charitable trust. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I, I suppose it depends how dismal a view you have of human nature. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that for all charitable trusts. I think charitable trusts, in the main, are absolutely splendid bodies, and the people involved in them are great. But there will be a minority uh, where whatever you set up is going to be hijacked. I want a way to unravel this uh, if it goes wrong. You remember the, the, the great difficulty with limited liability partnerships that were set up in Scotland and uh, money laundering and everything else that was flushing through Scotland from Eastern Europe and it had to be closed down afterwards. I am worried that these very, very lengthy trusts will be used by the super wealthy really to avoid a insight. And uh, I think the state... Uh, I'm not a Marxist or anything like it, but the state and the populace of Scotland have a legitimate interest in not having parts of their economy closed or controlled by entities that are unknowable and are controlled by people you can't find out who they are. Yeah. That, that, that's interesting, actually. Is, um, Yvonne Evans or Professor Breton, you get similar worries? Or? Um, I hadn't particularly thought about this before, but I agree that the domicile point is important, and it seems a bit strange that a protector should be able to change uh, the, yeah. the domicile of a trust. Um, that's an odd one to me. Um, yeah, yeah the, the domicile, change of domicile, or, or change of the law of the domicile, actually the wording is problematic, but uh, I'm worried about that as well. Yeah. Uh, I think we're all worried about that. Going back to um, uh, uh, Section uh, 41 in itself, um, I don't have very strong views, but uh, I think that um, uh, if Section 41 goes through, I think charities, uh, the, 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 the provision in subsection 5, the section does not apply to, to um, charities in paragraph B. I don't think that's right. I, one or two of the consultees didn't agree with that. I think actually charities are probably the one type of trust where uh, you, you don't really need controls because I think there are other controls in existence for charities. Um, if you do need controls on duration, it's actually not for charities. I think this is kind of 180 degrees wrong. Uh, and I think there's also uh, some, some, uh, some drafting problems there as well, but I don't think the policy is right. So uh, on the core question of duration, I'm not very clear in my mind. I was reasonably persuaded by the Scottish Law Commission's report on this, but I, I'm... Uh, I don't have a particular personal view on it, but I do think that the, the, the exclusion of charities in, in subsection 5 is, is, is the wrong way around. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and as we said earlier, I'm concerned like Roddy and uh, Yvonne about the, the domicile point, uh, which could make this worse, as Roddy says. But the domicile point is one that needs to be considered in, in itself, even apart from section 41. Mm -hmm.
Okay, that takes it off at a slightly different angle from, from the duration element of it. But um, but I <coughs> I think that adds uh, that adds to our background and depth of knowledge here actually, and I think it's worthwhile listening to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Jeremy. Uh, thank you. Um, if I can move us on to um, Chapter Six of the Bill, which makes it clear private purpose trusts are permitted in Scots law and sets out certain requirements as to how these trusts can be run. Again, in policy terms, are the requirements of Chapter Five uh, stringent enough to guard against possible abuse of these trusts? very strong views about, about this myself. I, I would simply reiterate the point about domicile again. Hey, limited companies can't change their domicile. Why on earth should these people should be able to change their domicile and attempt why would they want to to attempt to escape the scrutiny of the Scottish courts uh, and the legislation in Scotland? This bill relates to Scottish trusts. If an attempt to change your domicile means it's no longer a Scottish trust, we'll set something up here, waltz off to somewhere else in the world, own Scottish land, and you can't find out who has, a, has an interest in it. It's as easy as that. And that's completely contradictory to the policy of the Register of Controlled Interest to find who owns Scotland. Uh, if I were advising someone who was a Russian oligarch, I'd go straight for this one and the change of domicile of this a uh, private purpose trust where you can't even work out who... The beneficiaries are. How do you get hold of the documentation once they go abroad, as it were? What are the nature of the rights? Because as soon as you move from Scottish jurisdiction to English jurisdiction, the nature of the rights changes. We, they don't have the same type of trust in England. So again, I have no problem with private purpose trust. We have them already. We have many of these set up as individual foundations. There's even case law on this, which I would have liked to have seen a little more exploration of this prior to bringing this in, but that's a purely academic point. I like this generally. I quite like private purpose trust, but I don't like this idea of changing domicile. I think they should be locked into Scotland so you can keep an eye, an eye, an eye on them. Um, yeah, well, we agree on the, on the domicile point. I think we're probably all agreed on that. I think this is, needs to be looked at again. Uh, on private purpose trusts, I do have one or two hesitations, uh, which I mentioned I had to put in a very late consultation response. I don't know if it reached you. And uh, since then, I've been doing some more work, and I, I might put in a supplementary if that's any be interest to you. Um, but on private purpose trusts, one thing is I'm a bit concerned about the definition. Now, people always talk about definitions, and they nitpick with draft legislation, and you can always do that. But I think there's actually a, a, a significant issue here, because it says private purpose trust... Uh, what is it? It's a specific purpose. Well, all trusts in Scotland of every type have their purposes. I mean, take a, a vanilla favour, just a very, very ordinary private law trust, um, uh, set up a trust for, um, sorry, traditional example, uh, your widow for her life and then for your eldest son thereafter, if you'll forgive me for using a traditional example. Um, uh, that has its purposes hold for the for the widow and and, and uh, the oldest son and the, for their respective interests so i don't think we've managed to, to demarcate what a private purpose trust is from from other trusts because in scotland english law is a bit different on this they don't talk about purposes in the same way as we do but the idea of all trusts having their purposes this this goes back this is deep in scots law and continues continues to be the case and indeed uh, this bill itself talks about purposes for trusts not just private purposes trusts and quite rightly so, because that, that is the way we conceptualise. So I think more work is needed to, on what is a private purpose trust as opposed to another sort of trust. I think specific purpose is, is, isn't, doesn't really quite cut the mustard. That's my own view. I'm ready to be shot down on that. Um, and my other concern is a bit more nebulous, but um, it's that um, the worry that uh, you're setting up a kind of ownerless trust, uh, which, because it is ownerless, is going to be immune to creditors' claims. Um, uh, in an in a ordinary private law trust, the beneficiaries have their beneficial interests and they can be attached by their creditors if they're insolvent. Um, but here, in a private purpose trust, it seems you don't really have beneficiaries in that sense. And I'm slightly worried that this could be used for asset protection purposes. I mentioned that in my paper, the, the consultation response. I'm not sure how well-founded this concern is. It may not be well-founded, but I thought I, I would 
mention it, and it's also by way of background, if someone with money wants to set up an asset protection vehicle whereby there's a fund of assets for to benefit their family uh, and, and no creditors can ever get that clause into it, there are other ways of doing this anyway, uh, if you're well advised. Uh, if you have, when I say well advised, you're advised by clever clever law firms. So there are actually other ways of doing asset protection. And I'm a little bit concerned about that. So I think that, the, so I, I'm, I have a bit of concern about private purpose trusts. Um, I'm not, not against them, but I'm just a bit concerned. So those are the two points I mentioned. Uh, the definition I don't think cuts the mustard. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about creditors, but, but I may be, may be wrong on both points. Uh, yeah, I'm glad for that. I mean, if, if you are sending in a supplement to your supplement, if you have any idea of a definition yourself, or could point the committee towards a definition, yeah. that would be helpful so that if we're looking at amendments at certain stages, we are probably not the best people to be drafting definitions. Sure. Drafting is difficult. <laughs> yeah. OK, th thank you. Thank you. If, if I can move on and perhaps uh, direct this question initially um, um, at Ms Evans, because um, I noticed in your response to the committee consultation, you said you didn't think the standard of care applicable to supervisors and protectors was clear. I wonder if you could maybe just expand slightly on that and then do your colleagues agree with your comments? Well, this is particularly in relation to professional trustees because obviously the standard of care will be higher for professional trustees and I would tend to think that protectors and supervisors might be professional trustees and I just wanted to clarify that that was meant to carry across to them um, or if indeed you wanted to have a different, higher standard of care for protectors and supervisors given how powerful they are. I think just a clarification <coughs> on that would be useful. And I, I, do you think there should be a higher... I, I, I definitely think there should be a higher um, standard of care on professional trustees. And I absolutely agree with the um, kind of exception to that, which is when you've got professional trustees who are acting in a non-professional capacity, because those of us with a bit of trust expertise are always getting asked to come on to this committee or that committee and give off the cup advice. And we don't really want to be on on the hook for that. We probably wouldn't sign up to, to these things. Um, I think that's a sensible um, balance between... Um, trustees' responsibilities and protecting uh, beneficiaries. Uh, is there an agreement again yeah, on this point? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Committee. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> move on to Section 61 of the Bill, and that's uh, with regards to private trusts. Uh, so Section 61 uh, gives uh, the power to the beneficiaries and others to apply to the court to alter the trust purposes of a family trust, and it sets out uh, the default position that this power can't be used for 25 years. Uh, given that the views on the 25-year restrictions have been mixed on the consultation and it's uh, default power only, are you all satisfied that it's the right policy decision to retain the 25-year restriction in the bill? Yvonne. I disagreed with the 25 years. I think it's quite a long time. Um, I know that when I was in practice, um, you would draft around that sort of provision. Um, so it very much depends what um, the person is setting up the trust for. Um, do they want maximum flexibility, in which case you'd want immediately to have that power? Um, or do they actually want to retain control for a period of time, um, in which case a longer duration would be workable? I mean, this doesn't override that possibility um, that they can choose a different... Um, period of time. Um, but to me, 25 years is quite a long time in the scheme of things. You've also got the quite complicated provisions around when does the time start for um, a trust that's in a will, um, and particularly, you know, if someone writes their will and then they, they live for a period of time before they die, when does that 25-year clock uh, kick off um, is, is a bit of a, you know, a complicated um, thing in there. Thank you. Professor Paisley? I, I don't have any particular objection to this clause, but I would lessen 25 years. It just is quite a lengthy period. It's far longer than the period of negative prescription, which applies to property matters. I, to what you'd bring it down to? Well, just less than 25 years. I, would, <laughs> I couldn't tell you what it is, but maybe, maybe 10. 24 years, nine months. That'll do. That'll do. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would agree with what Yvonne says. Um, uh, yes, I don't think I really have anything to add, but maybe something like 20 years, but um, yeah. No, I haven't got anything really useful to add now. 
Okay, no, thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, going back to kind of, uh, the, the previous, uh, one of the previous questions and the, the issue regarding the, uh, the moving domicile, would that actually be an issue with regards to, to this in terms of the, the 25 years? Good grief, that's a good question. The simple answer is scrap this moving domicile business. Yeah, just, just get rid of moving domicile, in my view. I, I don't really understand exactly what people are trying to achieve when they're moving domicile, to be perfectly honest. But it strikes me as if you're letting trust be perpetual, just like a juristic body, like a limited company that could potentially live forever, why on earth should trust be able to move domicile when a limited company cannot? A trust, we, we all know how trust can be used to emulate other legal relations, how they can hide ownership and so on and so on. It, there's a dark edge to moving domicile that I really do not like at all. And I could suggest various things. If you allow a trust to move domicile, you should have certain restrictions. But if I could put it this way, once you allow a trust to move domicile, how do you see the documentation to see who's involved? The answer is you don't. You never get it back. It goes out into the world like a virus. I don't want Scotland to have that reputation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you. Good. And Mercedes. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to move us on to section 65 and 66, expenses of litigation. Um, so the Law Society, um, while supportive of the bill overall, um, they are very concerned about the current policy underpinning section 65, which provides principles to determine how legal bills are paid for in trust cases. And it says that trustees shouldn't find themselves personally liable for the expenses of litigation where there is insufficient trust property. So the Law Society thinks Section 5 um, will deter people from becoming trustees and may lead them to unfavourably settle or abandon legal proceedings for fear of personal liability. So we'd like to know if you share these concerns or if you can offer the committee any reassurance in this regard. Professor Gretchen. I, I have not researched this. Uh, when I read Section 65, it struck me as fine, um, but I've not really researched it. The only thing I noticed in Section 65 is a detail, which is that uh, the trustee um, maybe liable if the litigation is unnecessary. Well, that, that's true if the, it's the trustee who litigates, but if the trustee is the defender, it may be someone else is litigating unnecessarily. And then that, so I think the wording doesn't work there. But um, more generally, I don't have an answer. I've not really looked into this properly. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Professor Paisley? Again, I haven't looked at it in great detail, but I think possibly those concerns as narrated to us are slightly overstated in the sense that for litigation there are various products available together with insurance that a certain expenses can be covered or at least mitigated so that, that's all i would wish to say on that thank you Yvonne? yeah i think they're, they're possibly a little bit overstated um i can't recall exactly what um the point the law society was trying to make although as i said it was part of their discussions in this um i'm not a litigation expert um, I think it might be more about the wording of the section than the actual substance, but I know you're speaking to the Law Society next week, so you'll be able to ask them then. Okay. Thank you. Mercedes? <coughs> Thank you. I think I'll leave that there and move on to part two of the bill, um, looking at section 72, the Mercedes. right of Mercedes, just before you move on, I think just in terms of the panellists, <laughs> Um, obviously, as uh, everyone just indicated, we've got the lost site next week. If the panellists yeah. do have any uh, any further thoughts on this between now and next week, if you wanted to uh, send something into the committee, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sorry, Mercedes. No, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I wanted to look at the issue of the right of a spouse or civil partner to inherit. Um, so looking at the part of the bill that deals with succession law, um, a few different um, uh, people who responded um, to the um, call for views, including Ms Evans, who we have here today, have said that a distinction should be drawn between spouses or civil partners who are living with the deceased person at the time of their death and spouses or civil partners who had previously separated from the deceased person 
but hadn't actually divorced or, or had the partnership dissolved. So um, the committee is interested to hear from um, our other panel members' um, views on this. Um, and I suppose we're looking to find out how, how easy it is in practice to draft legislation making separation a key factor um, within the scope of um, this section 72, when sometimes in practice, um, even if a, a couple have finally separated for good, it may not be entirely clear at a given point in time. So practically speaking, how could legislation address this? You're going? Well, I mean, at the current law, um, is unfair because it looks, although it does cover the situation of separated um, couples, because at the moment um, the prior right for the dwelling house um, is only available if the spouse was ordinarily resident there. That's the term that gets used. And that can be unfair if the spouse has moved out and it's the deceased spouse who'd kept on living in the house. So that can be un unfair to them. They can miss out on um, £473,000 worth of house. Um, so that in itself is unfair, um, whereas I think um, now the um, proposed new law is, is pretty liberal, too liberal in my view, um, because you could have been separated a very, very long time um, and then suddenly be able to inherit a very substantial estate. Um, and although you could have a situation where you've also got a cohabitant and they still would have a Section 29 claim, um, so that, that's a possibility. Um, and my other concern here was about um, how this then translates to um, cohabitant situations. So if we imagine a situation where there's no spouse, um, there's a Section 29 claim for cohabitants. At the moment, the Family Act, uh, Family Scotland Act 2006, Section 29, says the maximum that a cohabitant can get is what a spouse would get. So by changing the law here on what a spouse without children can get to everything, I think the follow on from that would be that a cohabitant should also be able to take everything. Um, so that, that, was, that would be my view as well. And I think that should be sort of updated and followed through on. Thank you. Professor Paisley. This issue of ordinarily resident is, is quite tricky. A, a, Yvonne has mentioned how it's referred to in section nine. This is not a matter that's addressed in the bill where a, a surviving spouse has to have been ordinarily resident in the house to inherit it. If it's at all possible, I would like that to at least be explicated because on many occasions, such as for example my own parents, if they had been living in Scotland, a, when one of them died, the other was in a home. They certainly weren't ordinarily resident in the house in that case, except on a very charitable reading of the statute. But if someone survives and is permanently resident in care, how they can be ordinarily resident in the home somewhat troubles me. And it would be a very, very simple declaration to amend Section 9 now in the course of this bill. There are other things like someone being in the Navy serving in the armed forces for a length of time, or even someone being in jail. That might require a little consideration, but my primary sympathy is for someone who's in long-term care never to come back. You know, that's the problem. They're never going to go back to that house. Thank you. Professor Gretton. Um, yes. Uh, first, just a, a sort of footnote. Um, obviously, when people separate, it's quite quite common for them to have a separation agreement. Um, you know, if they're not too embittered and hostile, you, you can quite often get a separation agreement. And then separation agreements usually have a clause dealing with what happens if one of them pops their clogs pr prior to divorce. So, so the, the, if you have that, well, that's well and good. So we're, we're really talking about the situation where there's a separation no divorce and no separation agreement either, which of course equally commonly happens, no separation agreement. Uh, uh, Mercedes asked about the, is separation reasonably definable? I, I don't think it's too, very problematic. I mean, you get you get the concept in, in the Family Law Act in relation to divorce, the time when they actually uh, separated is, is a, a key provision. Um, I don't, it, there will be slightly mushy cases, but uh, I don't, see this as a, 
as a big problem. Uh, Rod has mentioned uh, the, the parallel problem of, of ordinarily resident for the purposes of uh, prior rights. And of course, prior rights, so they would disappear in the situation where there's no issue if this amendment goes through, um, uh, will so apply whether our, our issue and there's an intestacy. Um, uh, so it may be Roddy ha has a point there. But um, so just to sum up, um, I, I, I generally support this, this, this provision. Um, about where there's no issue and, and uh, there's a the surviving spouse uh, takes his state. But I, I, I agree with uh, some other people, Yvonne and so on, that there should be an exception where there's a separation. And I don't see that as terribly problematic. I think that, does that cover the question? I think. Yeah. Yes, I think it does. I suppose the, the issue that we're grappling within the committee is how we might allow for separation to be a factor but without um excluding well some of the examples that um uh, were given by professor paisley you know if 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 the surviving spouse is not normally living um with the with the deceased at the you know there's a whole range of situations where that might occur um so how, how do we define separation without it merely being sort of geographical because obviously there's lots of circumstances where people might be physically separated but but still together as it were well i think that that's doable i don't think that terribly difficult just to add to roddy on section nine i don't think that can be opened up in this bill um that that would be too big a job but um, I, I think that's doable, separation. Um, I, I think uh, the, the drafters could tackle that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jeremy? Yeah, thank you. It was really just to follow up Professor Paisley's opening remark, or one of his opening remarks, that he felt succession could go further, Miss Bill. Um, and in case we miss that as we come towards the end of it, I just wonder whether you could expand slightly on those comments. In general, in, on succession law, well, where do you go with succession? There's legal rights, discretion, a forced provision, and so on and so on. There's been report after report on this, you know, for 25, 30 years in the Scottish Law Commission consultations. Nothing's gone forward. This straightforward way to deal with it, it is to tackle, to leave legal rights as they are but tackle anything that's obnoxious about them in other words a have some exclusions from legal rights in some cases that would be a minimalist approach it would be better than nothing in my view i i like legal rights i don't like discretion generally a I, I think legal rights work well so th there's constant sniping at legal rights let's just get rid of what's obnoxious and that can't be that hard uh, for those of us who are less aware of legal rights, yeah. what, what would you find obnoxious about, or which category of individual which kind of, are, are you wanting to remove from legal rights? Well, let me give you one example. A English couple have a drug addict son in Newcastle upon Tyne. A, he steals from them. They move to Scotland to get away from this character. He, they acquire Scottish domicile. They're subject to legal rights in their estate. When the old lady dies, followed by the old man, do the executors have to search for this guy in the gutters of Newcastle upon Tyne and pay him the money on legal rights? Well, according to the present Scots law, the answer is yes. I would take that out for a start. Yeah, but I mean, without, well, to play devil's advocate for a moment, Professor, I mean, that is a very subjective test because you, your morality may not be my morality and your decision, you know, I, I suppose in regard to defining, and, and I, you know, you are better doing this than I am, but in regard to putting forward a piece of legislation, yeah. we need to have some kind of principle and some kind of clarity around that. Right. So obviously, you know, we may or may not want to exclude that individual, yeah. but how do we make that decision in law? I, I would look at the civil codes of France, Germany, or Poland, or any of the continental civil codes where there are some circumstances that civil uh, legal rights can be, uh, forced provision can be avoided by a testator in certain defined circumstances. They're not everything we would want, but in large measure they provide the mechanism that you'd be seeking for, that forced provision is not absolutely bomb-proof. 
in some of these legal systems, there are extreme cases that they allow forced provision to got round, and I would suggest they should be looked at in the first place. There's usually a section of about four single lines that say a forced provision can be avoided provided one, two, three, four, and that's the way I would deal with it. And just to follow up one further, and maybe your colleagues could answer, would one of the ways be to exclude it by having a will? So if you write it directly into the will that you want to exclude legal rights, then that, or, or does that go too far? Uh, no, that doesn't. That's quite a good idea. But it, we've got lots of sections in here on how you can get rid of people as trustees. It's a similar type of thing. I want to get rid of my forced, forced error because I'm writing it in the will and I've justified it on the basis of the grounds set out in the civil code. You would not be able to say I don't want someone to have a legal rights on any ground whatsoever. It would have to fit in the recognised statutory headings. Okay. Do, I, do either of the other panellists have a view on this uh, change in law? Um, I mean, I think you, need, you should look at succession more widely, more generally in all these areas, um, you know, both testy and intestate, considering legal rights. Um, I think my, my view is if there's a will, that you, sh you should, as Professor Paisley says, you know, be able to uh, disregard legal rights in that, in that sense. And obviously you can't at the moment, so you can end up in these sorts of situations. That, that's fairly sensible to me. But I, I would um, definitely push for um, more. I know it's very controversial and that's why it's not happened, but um, the Scottish Law Commission has, has done a lot of work on succession that hasn't got anywhere. And like trust law until hopefully now, um, it's a mess. It's lots of different bits of legislation that have been added on and revised and tweaked as we've had civil partnerships and as we've had cohabitation and so on brought in. So it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, um, there's some areas of law where reform, you, you can get general consensus on the whole, such as the movable transactions bill um, uh, or, or on the whole on trusts. I mean, there, there's controversial issues, but on the whole you can get... But succession is notorious. You, you can't. Every, you, what you can get consensus on, and everyone will agree, that the current law is unsatisfactory. And you'll find the same answer in every other country in the world. If you go to Germany, everyone will agree the law is unsatisfactory. If you go to France, everyone will agree the law is unsatisfactory. What you can't get is consensus what should replace it. Uh, and, and that's true in Scotland. So this is... It, it, it's it's uh, Succession is, in a way, it's not surprising that this has gone on for years, a uh, process of proposed reforms and not much happening. Um, it's pretty intractable stuff. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm not saying it shouldn't be looked at further. I think it should be looked at further, but it's, it's not going to be a, a, an easy job. Um, but I would agree with Roddy, I, I, I support legal rights in Scots law, uh, and I agree they shouldn't be discretionary. But yes, there is there's certainly scope for reform. Certainly, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, well, thank you. Just before I bring in uh, Bill Kidd, so I mean, just following on from that point, Professor Gretton, in your submission, um, I mean, you, you state a full codification would have stretched the SLC's resources and would have considerably delayed the completion of the project. And from a practical point of view, the SLC had to stop somewhere. And passing the existing bill would not preclude the possibility of further measures at some point. Sorry, at some time in the future. Uh, so with that, um, in terms of the, the succession, um, with, the, with what's been proposed in the bill, notwithstanding some of the comments already today, um, do you think that would, uh, that's a, a useful starting point to update uh, some of the law in succession to then help with the uh, activity going forward? What's in part two, you mean, at the moment? Yeah, yeah no, this is good. Uh, as I say, I support part two. Um, uh, though I would I agree about the separation point um, and also the homicidal executor point, though that, that possibly should be part, uh, part one because uh, executors are trustees, but uh, the, the homicidal executors should be, as Roddy was saying earlier, uh, and, and that would be a, 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 an easy thing to put in, I think. Um, yes. But it's a good start. Yes, and it, it's good to see some things happening on succession. And, of course, the Succession Act of 2016, which this Parliament passed, uh, that made some progress. So I, I don't want to be too gloomy. The progress has been made, uh, and this is, will be further progress. So, yes, yeah. So, good stuff. Okay. No, thank you. Um, Bill Kidd. Right. Well, you've just about covered this here, actually, anyway. But um, just to sort of sum it up, really, um, last week, Scottish Law Commission told uh, this committee that in respect of Part 1, 
Um, it did not think full codification of trust law was necessary or desirable on their uh, part, um, and that part two um, was making limited proposals for succession law. Nonetheless, in respect to parts one and two, and you have pretty much covered a great deal of this, is there anything which has been missed out or not yet discussed which you think would be easy to add without interfering with the strong policy consensus that is currently associated with the bill? Is there anything you want to stick your oar in and sort of say this could be done as well or something? You know? Could I raise something with you? And it's a, it's a very straightforward point. Section 4, please, of the trusts element. Section 4.1 deals with the assumption of an additional trustee operating as a general conveyance of the trust property in favour jointly of the additional trustee and the existing trustees. Now, this is just a technical point that could fit in very sweetly into this simple section, and it's the following fact. When any trust assumes a new trustee in Scotland, a, it can't easily grant a lease, and it can't easily grant a servitude to derivative rail rights. Now, why is that important? They have to do an additional document called a notice of title, which to which attaches some taxes in the Land Register of Scotland registration dues as, as, as well. Now, with every other party, you can do a deduction of title. It's a technical point, a purely technical point. It's about five or six words added into a document. I think a trustees, assuming new trustees, should be allowed to deduce title. It'll avoid doing a notice of title. It'll make it simpler, and they should be able to do it in a lease. Why are leases important? Well, many, many charities, uh, sorry, a trust lease out property for an income. If they assume trustees, they'll go to this notice of title every time. Wind farm projects, for example, frequently involve landowners who are trustees who then have to do a notice of title, and that could be an enormous area of land and a lot of money for a notice of title. Uh, so for, to sum it up, allow trustees to reduce title for the purposes of leases and servitudes and fit it in at Section 4.1, at Section 4.1a or 4.2. That's interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, anything? A few quick points. Um, I think one thing is um, directions. So trustees' ability to ask the court for directions. Um, I'm not sure if I missed this point, but it seems to have dropped out of the bill. And I think it's a useful thing. There was a recent case at the end of 2021, Vindex trustees. And the, co the trustees there went to court. It was to do with an interpretation of a will um, to do with they weren't quite sure what charity was meant to benefit. And they proposed to give to a particular charity and then they asked the court if that was OK. And the court said, well, we can't give you directions, although they gave a little bit of a wink and a nod that they were probably acting reasonably. I think it would be really useful to trustees to have that ability and rather than making decisions and then worrying about what the comeback might be. Um, and secondly, just to go on to succession, I know we can't cover everything we don't want to, but a fairly uncontroversial thing is um, the cohabitation um, claim um, has to be done within six months. And I think a lot of people say that is too short a time for a grieving cohabitant to make a claim. Um, I know the Faculty of Advocates feel quite strongly about that. So I would propose 12 months. And I think that's, that's again, an easy win, a quick fix. Okay. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And Anything you'd like to round off, Professor Gretton, at all? Uh, I agree about petitions for directions. I, I don't know what's happened to that. There's been some confusion, I think, over the last uh, few years on this point. It does need to be looked at again, because I think there should be provision about petitions for directions. Yeah. I think there should be, and I, I don't know quite what's happened to it. I, I, no, I think I won't say any more just now. Okay. And Professor Paisley, were you? That you, you fine. Uh, fine. I think you, what you put in there was useful anyway, so that's fine. Uh, all three of you, thank you very much. That's very helpful, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so just before we, we, we do close, uh, are there any final points uh, that uh, uh, the panellists would like to highlight? Move on. No, Professor Gretton? No. And I could go on and say, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's been a most enjoyable session. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, can I can thank the panel for their helpful evidence uh, this morning. And the committee uh, may follow up by letter with any additional questions stemming from uh, today's session. So with that, once again, thank you very much. And I will now suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the room. Thank you. Thank you.
Under agenda item number three, we are considering instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. An issue has been raised on the draft international organisations, immunities and privileges, Scotland Amendment Order 2023. This order amends existing legislation to grant immunities and privileges insofar as they are within devolved competence to certain persons working with the International Criminal Police Organisation, Interpol. The order states that the term, and I quote, member country, it has the meaning it has in the constitution of Interpol. This term does not appear in Interpol's constitution. It does, however, appear in the agreement between the UK and Interpol, which is referred to in the order. When asked about this, the Scottish Government responded uh, with the term that member country has been used for consistency with the terms of the agreement and that this term has evolved into general use. Does the committee wish to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground H on account that the meaning of the term member country could be clearer? Also under this agenda item, no points have been raised on the draft police negotiation board for Scotland Constitution, Arbitration and Qualifying Cases, Regulations 2023. Is the committee content with this instrument? Yeah. Thank you. Under agenda item number four, we are considering an instrument subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2023-132. Is the committee content with this instrument? Under agenda item number five, we are considering an instrument which is not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2023-131. Is the committee content with this instrument? Thank you. And with that, I will move the committee into private.